All right, hello everyone. Uh, we're going to try narrating these classes. I'm going to go through this slideshow and comment on the material, and we'll see what happens. So first thing I want to do is establish some new class expectations. Now that we're online, things are going to be a little different. One of the things that's going to be different is that you will need to go onto Canvas and check the front page and announcements frequently. Uh, whenever I make a change or post an assignment or have something to say, I will likely edit both this front page and uh, make an announcement to have you uh, go to Canvas and, and, and figure out what's going on there. So check it frequently, keep an eye on things, and that's, that's how we're gonna handle things. Uh, also, instead of live lessons where we all try to coordinate um, and get online at the same time and surmount technical difficulties, uh, I'm going to instead try to pre-record short videos, no more than 25 minutes, um, like I'm doing now. And if you have questions or comments, you can email me, uh, but I would prefer if you take advantage of this, the discussion boards that I've put on Canvas uh, as a way for you to ask questions and for other students to uh, see those questions and see some answers. Uh, I'll do my best to visit those discussion boards and contribute what I can when I can, and hopefully that gives us some of the dynamic back of asking questions in class. And then finally, as you watch these videos and listen to my terrible voice, um, do yourself a favor and take notes as though it were an in-person lesson, and we'll do our best to, to uh, match that quality of lesson, but we'll see what happens. Uh, regarding your reading responses, they're only going to be, what did I say? I think I've written elsewhere that they're going to be uh, full credit for making an attempt in your own words. Um, so whether it's right or not, whether your response is accurate or not, doesn't really matter as long as it's in your own words and it's an attempt, you'll get full credit. If you reorder the words from the excerpt and don't really contribute any of your own insight, I might give you half credit, if any. And then obviously, if you don't submit anything, uh, you will not get any credit. So all that matters is that you make the attempt here. And then finally, uh, section reviews and the essay, which I've posted, those are gonna proceed as usual, just handle those through Canvas. Uh, as I said, if you have questions on any of this and what we're doing, check the front page or send me an email. So now let's get into uh, Force Law. And in particular, uh, Derrida, Jacques Derrida, the philosopher and his method of deconstruction. So what I want you to do is look at the words in front of you and imagine or see if you can come up with what the opposite of each word might be. So for instance, we have culture and civilization. What might the opposite of that be? Or when I say speaking, what would the opposite be? And so on for mind, for man, presence, literal reason and knowledge. So take a second, look at those words and try to imagine their opposites. So I assume you have something in mind, and I hope it is something like against culture, we have nature. So, and against speaking, talking out loud, we have writing. Against mind, what goes on in your head, we have body. Man, obviously the opposite is thought to be woman. Uh, if something is present, the opposite would be something being absent. Something is literal, to be taken literally. The opposite would be figurative or metaphorical. Against reason, we have emotion. And then lastly, against knowledge, we have something like belief or faith. You may have had similar answers, you may have had different answers, but the point is that each of these terms has an opposite. And the thinking of deconstruction is that all of thought or every idea is defined by or in, in terms of its opposite. Uh, the phrase is binary opposition. So binary meaning two, and opposition, unsurprisingly, meaning opposed. And so the thinking of deconstruction and what Derrida brings to philosophy is that every idea, whether it be culture, speaking, man, mind, whatever it is, has an opposite, and you only understand one term against its opposite. So everything is literally black and white 
or figuratively black and white. And so what deconstruction does is it scours texts or ways of thinking, systems of thought, philosophies, whatever. It scours these systems, finds these central ideas, and tries to flush out these oppositions in ideas. And it handles these oppositions as a three-step method here. So the first step is first to call attention to the oppositions, point them out, and to note that one side of the opposition is generally prioritized over the other. So for instance, culture or civilization is given some prioritization over nature. Or if you recall our feminism discussion uh, in the history of Western thought, man has been prioritized over women, reason has been prioritized over emotion, mind has been prioritized over body, etc., etc. So in every opposition, one idea is prioritized or favored over the other. Once that's established, what deconstruction does in particular is try to reverse these prioritizations by calling attention to tensions or contradictions in the oppositions. So there's tensions, there's problems, there's contradictions with prioritizing reason exclusively over emotion or prioritizing man exclusively over woman. And what deconstruction does is it wants to challenge those oppositions primarily by reversing them. So showing in what way civilization is dependent on nature, for instance, or in what way mind is dependent on body or reason is dependent on emotion. So taking the prioritization and reversing it. And I'll go through a couple of examples here to show you what that amounts to. So first, show the opposition and show how one side is prioritized over the other by revealing tensions and contradictions. Then you reverse the opposition in deconstruction. And then lastly, uh, in light of that reversal, what deconstruction shows us is that, in fact, these oppositions uh, in these prioritizations are not fixed. They don't really hold. And instead, the opposite terms are deeply interrelated dynamically interrelated and related in a way uh, that calls attention to paradox. And we'll flesh out that difficult paradox here when we go through these examples. But that's the three-step process. You first show and expose the priorities in these oppositions, reverse them, and by reversing them, you show that the terms are interrelated and they're interrelated in such a way that you find paradoxes or contradictions at play. So there's a paradoxical relationship between man and woman, a paradoxical relationship between mind and body, between civilization and nature, et cetera, et cetera. Now you notice aporia there, that's a Latin word, and it means impasse or uh, without path. And so what happens in deconstruction when you find these priorities and, and you reverse them, you don't simply settle on the reversal, but there's a back and forth, a dynamic back and forth where man is prioritized over woman, but woman is prioritized over man and then back and forth and it oscillates. Or you show that nature is dependent on culture, but at the same time, culture is dependent on nature and you, you um, really engage and flush out this dynamic interrelation uh, in terms of paradox or contradiction. But again, hopefully with some examples, this will be more clear. And so the point of deconstruction and Derrida's contributions to philosophy in general is that it strives to keep thinking or philosophy open-ended, dynamic, or alive, so to speak, by not allowing thinking to settle on a priority. So we're not allowed to settle on the priority of man over woman or the priority of reason over emotion. We, we bring deconstruction to these oppositions and show that we can't be so comfortable taking it for granted that reason is superior to emotion or mind is superior to body or what have you. Um, and this is because aporia, paradox, and contradiction, this dynamic interrelation keeps us from settling on, on any fixed priority. And the claim is that every text or philosophy or ideology or thought structure or system of thought or idea, whatever, everything, every idea in your head um, 
is susceptible to deconstruction, is susceptible to this play of binary opposition, and is susceptible to paradox and contradiction. And so deconstruction goes through these texts, shakes things up, so to speak, reveals these underlying paradoxes and contradictions and aporias, and keeps thoughts open-ended, alive, open to indefinite reinterpretation or to meaning something new. So let's look at an example here, man and woman. So there's an outdated conceptual priority that has man ranked over women, prioritized over women. We saw this in our feminism review. And the thinking is that men are strong, they're leaders, they're rational, and that's prioritized over women who are weak, obedient, emotional, what have you. Um, just take a look at any Western or Eastern tradition for that matter, and you'll see this priority at play where man is prioritized over woman. So a deconstructive reading of this binary opposition would first highlight this priority. And then step two is the reversal, where we show that in certain respects, man, or woman rather, is prioritized over man. So what would this look like? It's a little thin, but take it for what it is. The thinking is that these very ideas that define man, strength, leadership, and rationality, uh, they only are what they are. Those concepts only make sense in light of notions of weakness, obedience, and emotion. So whatever concepts characterize man, strength, leadership, and rationality, they depend, they, their meaning is dependent on concepts that characterize woman. So one cannot be strong unless there is someone who is weak. One cannot be a leader unless there is someone who obeys. One cannot be rational unless there is something to oppose rationality to, that is emotion. So while on the one hand, we wanna say that man and what defines man is prioritized over women, what deconstruction shows us is that that very concept of man and the very concepts that make up man are conceptually dependent on the very concepts that make up women. And so given this, given that on the one hand, there's the priority of man over women, but at the same time, that what man is, is dependent on women, we get this dynamic interrelation between man and woman. Man depends on woman, woman depends on man, everything is caught up here. And so there's a paradox here. Without woman, man would not be man. So man needs woman in order to be man. Man depends on woman in order to be man at all and vice versa. Uh, whatever woman is, whatever concepts define our notion of woman depends on man and the concepts that define our notion of man. So there's this paradoxical interrelation that man is what man is only because of women and woman is only what woman is because of man. So now let's also look at uh, knowledge and faith as another opposition here. So the conceptual priority is that knowledge is superior or prioritized over faith. Um, it's better, the thinking is, it's better to go through life basing your, or acting only in light of certain knowledge, scientific evidence, empirical truths, and it's somewhat discouraged to act only on faith. The thinking is that you're a little irresponsible if you behave only on what you believe rather than what you know. And so knowledge is something justified. It's got evidence, it corresponds to the world. But faith on the other hand is speculative. It's more of a hunch. It's taken on belief alone and you can have faith in something without regard to evidence. So the operative priority that we see, I think quite often in the 21st century is that it's better to have knowledge and to act on knowledge than it is to have faith and act on faith. However, and this is a specifically, uh, this is specifically a point that Derrida raises. What we see is that we can reverse this priority unsurprisingly such that faith is superior to knowledge. And this is the case because the process of acquiring knowledge first begins at ignorance. We don't know what we're talking about. We seek out information from this state of ignorance. So I don't know what's going on. I look for information to, to enlighten me. And this information is taken to justify my belief and what really makes it knowledge. So I don't know what I'm talking about. I gather information. This information justifies a belief that I have. And so I have knowledge. Now, what's important here is that at each stage, one gives credit, 
credence, faith, or trust, that all amounts to really the same thing here. One believes in, has faith in, or trusts that the information they have justifies their knowledge or their beliefs. And so in this process of acquiring knowledge at each stage, faith is necessary. I need to have faith or trust in the information that I'm getting. I need to have faith or trust that this information justifies my belief. And so knowledge in the process of acquiring knowledge depends fundamentally on faith. And so this means that we have on the one hand, this priority of knowledge over faith. You should have, you should act in light of justified evidence that corresponds to the real world. But at the same time, this very knowledge depends on faith for it to come about in the first place. And so there's this interrelation between knowledge and faith that's paradoxical. Knowledge depends on faith. And at the same time, if we wanted to, we could show how faith depends on knowledge. Um, I'm only going in one direction for the time being, but I hope you see the point. And so now when we go to force of law, the binary opposition is between law and violence. But before we get into the three-step process that handles this opposition, I want to clarify these terms. When we talk about law in force of law, we're not talking about written law or legislation alone. To some extent we are, but Derrida has in mind a notion of law that's more broad. And so think for a minute about where else we've heard talk of law in our ethics class. Hopefully what came to mind was Kant's moral law, which of course isn't written legislation, it's something more abstract, but it's a law nonetheless. And it's the notion that without moral law, our wills will be violently unrestrained, will fail to conform to reason, and will, and will not be good wills. So elsewhere in ethics, we've heard talk of law. And so in force of law, we're not just talking about ordinary law, written legislation, we're also talking about ethical law. And so what Derrida says about law applies to our earlier ethical prescriptions to promote happiness. Arguably, there's a law in Mill that tells us one must promote happiness. There's obviously the moral law in Kant, and then there's the law, more or less, in Aristotle that tells us you must have a virtuous character. So law here, again, is very abstract. It's very general. It's basic commandments or um, prescriptions to behave a certain way or to do something. And in our ethics class, it's the law that tells us we ought to be a good person and do the right thing. And so that's the law we're talking about here. Now, the violence is also somewhat abstract, not only physical violence here. There's going to be a relation between abstract law and violence, and it's not going to be the sort of punching somebody in the face violence we're thinking of, not only physical violence, but more general, more abstract violence. And so at the abstract level, this sort of violence is any forceful imposition of something on someone without their consent, even something abstract like a code of law or way of life. And if we forcefully impose this on somebody, we violently impose it on them. So for instance, Kant tells you to have a good will. He says the moral law is that you should only conform to reason and silence your inclination. And he tells you this, he says, you must do this. In other words, he forcefully imposes this law to follow reason and have a good will on you. And to some extent, because he's telling you this is what you have to do, there's a forceful imposition and there's something violent there. You didn't ask to only follow reason, you were told to. And so against your will, you were told to only follow reason. And the thinking is that there's some abstract sort of violence going on there. I'm not going to go too far into this, but in deconstruction, in general, the sort of violence that is at issue is when we read a text and we misinterpret it. So when I read the Constitution and I say that it, I don't know, justifies exploiting people for my, so that I can make a profit, um, or somehow I read the Const, or I read the Bible uh, in order to justify owning slaves or what have you. Arguably, we've misinterpreted the Constitution and the Bible in those cases, and so we've read them violently. We've misinterpreted them. We've forcefully imposed a reading on them that they don't ask for. <clears throat> and so this sort of misinterpretation of a text 
is a sort of violence, and most of deconstruction deals with that sort of violent misinterpretation. But here in force of law, we're talking about abstract law, any forceful imposition that tells you what to do, like be a good person or do the right thing, and the claim is going to be that there's some sort of underlying violence there, some sort of forceful imposition. So let's look at law and violence, and let's go through the three-step process with law and violence. So intuitively, when we think of law and we think of violence, there's a priority of law and justice over violence. The thinking is that law in general is supposed to embody justice and that this is good because it prevents violence. Uh, we put laws in place so that we don't all act violently and do whatever we want. And so laws are good, they keep the peace and they keep violence at bay, which generally we don't like. However, Oh, sorry. By following the law, doing what one has to do, what is fair to do, and what we all must do, violence is kept at bay. That's what I just said there. So for that reason, just law is prioritized over violence. Uh, we like to follow the law. It keeps the peace. And violence is bad. Generally, we're not fans. And so without just laws, violence would reign. And so it's the enforcement of just laws that prevents violence. And that enforcement is going to be a key word here moving forward. So note that laws are enforced. And now we reverse the priority. And so what Derrida shows us in force of law is that law prevents violence. We follow the just law and so avoid violence. But at the same time, the law is enforced. The law is violently imposed on us. You don't have a choice. If you're under 21, you cannot drink. Um, you, drugs are illegal and these laws are enforced. And so one tells you do not do drugs. And so the thinking is that these laws like don't drink if you're underage, don't drink and drive, don't beat people up for no reason. The thinking is that those laws are in place because they prevent violence. But at the same time, what Derrida shows us is that these laws are enforced and note the root of force there. There's a force of law. That is to say, law is violently imposed on us. One tells us, do not drink if you're under 21. One tells us, um, you know, do not commit perjury if you're, if you're testifying under oath. And you are told to do that. You don't really have a choice. In other words, this law has authority over us because we are coerced into following the law and sometimes physically break the law. You get arrested. Sometimes that means police officers tackle you and forcefully constrain you and physically constrain you. Um, and so what we get is this. Oh, sorry. What we get is that there is no just law. There is no law in general that isn't violently enforced. And any law whatsoever, moral, legislation, what have you, it only operates as law if it is violently enforced. And so what we see here, hopefully, is that there's an interrelation between law and violence. Law, on the one hand, is prioritized over violence. It's meant to prevent violence, to keep it at bay, and to keep the peace. But it only does this by appealing to a violence of its own. That is, it's enforced. It's violently imposed on us. So there's a violent imposition of law put over us to prevent violence. And that should sound weird and paradoxical and contradictory because it is law and justice, which are taken to prevent violence, themselves depend on violent enforcement in order to be what they are at all and vice versa. So here we have the paradox of the violent force of just law. So let's this is uh, developing the interrelation between law and violence here. And so, as I've already said, without force, law and justice are powerless. In order for a law to keep the peace, it has to be enforced. The just law, to be the just law, must be violently enforced. Hang on a second. And so because laws are violently enforced, Derrida says there's something weird going on here. Laws don't embody justice like we suppose they did because they're enforced on us. They don't reflect justice. They're not in themselves just. There's not this notion of justice that's floating around in our minds that we go, oh, that's what justice is. Let's legislate that and put it into law. 
let's have our laws reflect justice. That's not what's happening. There is not this ethereal notion of justice that then gets incorporated into law, precisely because laws are violently enforced, and that violent enforcement is unjust here. So just laws, somewhat paradoxically, are unjust. And so now I introduce quotation marks here. Laws are just, so to speak, They're, they keep the peace, so to speak, only because they are violently enforced. And so what we take to be justice, this notion of fairness, what we ought to do, what one must do, it's just, so to speak, only because it's enforced in law. And so in other words, laws enforce this bizarre notion of justice. Um, and so there's not this ethereal notion of justice that we put into law, but instead we just write laws, we just enforce them, and whatever the law says is the right thing to do, we say, aha, that's what justice is. And so we develop our notion of justice in light of what has already been commanded to us in the form of law. Um, laws tell us what justice is, rather than justice telling us what should be law. Whatever the law is, whatever is enforced, that's what we take justice to be. And so here we get to the contradiction. Laws are just, laws keep the peace in quotation marks just because they are violently enforced. But at the same time, this violent enforcement is an injustice. It's coercion. You didn't ask for it. It was forced upon you. Um, there's something unjust about being told what to do. You have no say in the matter. And so there's this paradox here that laws, just laws that are thought to promote justice and keep the peace, which is good. What deconstruction shows us is that these laws that keep the peace at the same time depend on violent enforcement. A law must be enforced. A law that keeps the peace must be violently enforced. And the paradox then is that these just laws themselves are unjust or an injustice. And so hence the uh, quotation marks around just. They're not really just laws if they're violently enforced. And so, you know, these laws that we take to keep the peace um, depend on an underlying notion of violence that is not really peaceful. And so there's the paradox there. All right, so laws are just in quotes just because they are violently enforced. Uh, this is to say there is not this ethereal notion of justice that we then legislate, but we legislate whatever the hell we want. We make arbitrary laws, we enforce them, and th those enforced laws tell us what the right thing to do is. So laws are just, just because they are enforced. So we don't follow laws, whether that's written legislation or abstract moral laws, we don't follow laws because they are in themselves a reflection of justice, but rather we follow laws, whatever they are, because they are enforced or have authority. We follow laws because we have to, because we are forced to, because they are violently enforced and so have authority. In other words, we follow laws because we believe that we have to, Laws have authority because we believe that they have authority. We are told this is the right thing to do. And so what this means in terms of the mystical foundation of authority from the reading is that the authority of law, whatever it is, Kant's moral law, Mill's commandment to promote happiness, Aristotle's commandment to have a virtuous character, and in general, our ethics, our standard ethical theories that we've covered so far of doing and being when what ought to do and be, the authority of those rest only on our belief in them, that we are told to and we believe that this is the law. And this is the mystical foundation of authority that Derrida is talking about and that he uh, quotes Montaigne on. And that is to say, again, laws don't have authority because they reflect this notion of justice that we all agree on. Laws do not have authority because they are in themselves good or keep the peace. Rather, they have authority because they're forced on us. We're told this is the right thing to do. We develop a belief that what the law says must be the right thing to do because it is enforced. And this is that mystical foundation. Laws hold sway over us because we believe in their authority. Uh, if you're under 21, I presume you don't drink 
because you believe that somebody under 21 ought not to drink because it is the law. And it is that belief that, that directs your action and keeps you from drinking, assuming you uh, actually follow the law there. And so given that laws are not in themselves just and they do not reflect justice, but they're violently enforced, and given that the violent enforcement of just laws, so to speak, is itself an injustice, and because that laws only have authority because we believe in them, then, according to Derrida, there's a distinction between quote-unquote just laws, you know, the, the laws that tell us what to do, there's a difference between those just laws and true and genuine justice, because those just laws are enforced, and that enforcement is unjust, and if that's the case, there must be some notion of justice, something that doesn't depend on violent enforcement, something free of violence, something that doesn't coerce us, something that we're free to engage with, uh, should we so decide, uh, not something forced on us. So on the one hand, we have the just laws, just quote unquote just laws forced on us, which is an injustice. And against that, we have true genuine justice. And this brings us to the quote that I mentioned for your reading response. There's Montaigne distinguishing laws, that is to say law, legislative, moral, what have you, from justice. The justice of law, quote unquote, this forced do this thing of law, that is not really justice. And that is to say laws are not just in as much as they are laws, in as much as they are laws. Um, yeah, if something is legislated, it's not reflecting this notion of justice. One does not obey them because they are just, but because they have authority. You do what you do what the law says, not because you believe it is the right thing to do, but because you are told to do it. That is to say, you do what the law says, not because you believe that will bring about justice or fairness, but because you believe that's what you have to do, simply for the fact that it's violently enforced on you. And so the word credit carries all of the weight of the proposition, yada, yada, yada. There's the mystical character of authority. You believe in the law, and that's where its authority comes from. It's enforced on you. You're told this is the right thing to do, and so you go, okay, that must be the right thing to do. And so the authority of laws rests only on the credit that is granted to them. One believes in it. That is their only foundation, and that's an act of faith. And so because just laws, so to speak, because legislation and moral law, because the law don't drink if you're under 21, and because the moral law follow reason against inclinations, because these laws are enforced on you, violently enforced upon you because you're coerced into doing these things, uh, that is an injustice. And so one wonders then what genuine justice would be. And the next lecture is going to try to unpack this notion of genuine justice in contrast to the injustice that is violently enforced laws. So let's recap everything here. What is deconstruction? It is a way of reading texts or systems of thought or dealing with ideas that focuses on binary oppositions. The first thing it does is it notices the priority of those oppositions. It then cleverly reverses the priority so that what you thought was prioritized is in fact dependent. And because we have man prioritized over woman and woman prioritized over man, or because we have knowledge prioritized over faith and at the same time faith prioritized over knowledge, because we have this priority and its reversal simultaneously, we get this interrelation and it manifests itself as a paradox, as a contradiction or an aporia. That all means the same thing. So there's a paradox of faith and knowledge. On the one hand, knowledge is prioritized over faith and paradoxically at the same time, knowledge depends on faith. Uh, same thing with man and woman. There's a paradox that in some respects, man is prioritized over woman, but at the same time, what man is depends on woman. So man is at once prioritized over woman and dependent on woman. And then lastly, with law and justice, we 
tend to prioritize law and keeping the peace, or I'm sorry, uh, with law and violence. We tend to prioritize law and keeping the peace over violence, but at the same time, law depends on violence in order to be enforced. So we have law prioritized over violence, and the reversal that violence uh, gives rise to law, and so we have that paradoxical interrelation between law and violence, where on the one hand, law is prioritized over violence, and on the other hand, law depends on violence. So here we go, everything I just said, just law prioritized over violence, but we reverse that and show that just law depends on violence, the force of law is its violent imposition, and that leaves us with this interrelation between quote unquote just law that's violently enforced and uh, violence that depends on law. Paradoxically, law and justice depend on violent enforcement to be law and justice. That is to say, law and justice depend on injustice to be law or justice. That's a paradox, that's a contradiction, that makes no sense. Paradoxically, just law is unjust, it's an injustice. And so what Derrida concludes from this, this deconstructive reading of law and justice is that there must be some notion of justice that's independent of what we see written into laws, because what we see written into laws is precisely an injustice. Laws are violently enforced. They tell us what to do. We're coerced into following laws. There's something unjust about all of that. And so the point of this essay is to seek out what true and genuine justice might be, uh, which will be the focus of the next reading. Again, the mystical foundation of authority is that laws only have authority over us because we believe in them. I believe that it is right for me not to use illicit drugs, and so I don't. Whether or not it is actually right for me to use illicit drugs, who cares? All that matters is that I believe in the law. That is the source of its authority. And so for the next class, for the next, not class, but video lesson, uh, we will explore what true genuine justice would be for deconstruction and ethics generally. So thank you. See you next time.